you were you exposed to even 10% of what your kids are exposed to on a weekly, monthly basis. They are, you know, they are exposed to probably a thousand percent more hypersexualized media than we were. You had to really seek it out. You know, there was innuendo, but there was not the in-your-face stuff that is all around them, whether it's on the playground, if it's from billboards, if it's walking in the mall, if it's at the checkout counter while they're doing their homework and stumbling upon something innocently. It's just so much more than you or I was ever were ever exposed to. These negative messages about our bodies, about genders, and about relationships, because they're harmful. They're, they're basically the things that are pulling our culture apart, you know, of just not having kindness and love for each other. Welcome to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. If some days you doubt yourself and you don't know what you're doing, if you've ugly cried alone in your bedroom because you felt like you're failing, well, I just want you to know you're not alone and you have come to the right place. Raising tweens and teens in today's world is not easy. And I'm on a mission to equip you to love well and to raise emotionally healthy, happy tweens and teens that thrive. I believe that moms are heroes and we have the power to transform our family and to impact future generations. If you are looking for answers, encouragement, and to become more of the mom and the woman that you want to be, welcome. I'm Cheryl Gould and I am so glad that you're here. Hi friend, welcome to the show today. I am so glad that you're here. And in today's episode, we're gonna talk about how to have healthy talks about sex and intimacy in a confusing culture. When it comes to sex, our bodies, love and intimacy, our kids are bombarded with false, unhealthy and confusing messages. And how do we talk to our kids about what healthy relationships, sex, and intimacy looks like? Well, my special guest today is Dina Alexander, and she is here to help us navigate this challenging landscape and empower our kids with the knowledge they need for healthy, positive, and wonderful, intimate relationships. I loved this conversation with Dina, and she is the author of 30 Days of Sex Talks for ages 8 to 11, Empowering Your Child, and also 30 Days of Sex Talks for ages 12 plus. And I absolutely love this interview with her. I got so many great nuggets. I ordered both of her books, which are included in the show notes. And in this episode, she's going to provide us with some tools and insights necessary to having these sometimes uncomfortable, I would say almost all the time, (laughs) uncomfortable, but essential discussions with our tweens and teens. So let's dive in. Well, welcome, Dina, to the Moms of Tweens and Teens podcast. I am so excited to talk to you today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, you have written quite a few books on sex, and I'm just going to list just a few of the books you've written, 30 Days of Sex Talks for Ages 3 to 7, Empowering Your Child with Knowledge of Sexual Intimacy, 30 Days of Sex Talks for ages 8 to 11. You also have one for 12 and up. You also have another book, How to Talk to Your Kids About Pornography. So we are going to be talking all about sex today and how to talk to our kids. So I am excited and scared and uncomfortable (laughs) to talk talk about these things that we need to be talking about. Um, I just want to launch in and I'm so curious to know, like, how did you get into this? So great question. So because a lot of people that are in the same movement and doing this, they usually have had 
issues come up in their life. They've had spouses with problems or whatever. But for me, it was a little different. It was just one day uh, we had just moved and I was kind of deciding what I wanted to do next in my life. All of my kids were in school. I was a stay home mom. And uh, I read this article on Facebook about teen porn consumption. And I could not believe it. I literally was sitting there being like, no, no, this can't be, this can't be right. So I started researching. I started trying to figure out what was going on. And it led me to realize, oh my gosh, okay. Because I had never watched online pornography. I had never seen it. I had seen magazines growing up here and there at a bookstore or whatever. And I, I, was, I was floored. I saw how misogynistic it was. I saw the violence in it. I saw the false counterfeit sex they were showing and realized how many kids were watching it. And I thought to myself, okay, I got to do something about this. And it was like a fire inside me. I thought, I've got to talk to as many parents as I possibly can about this topic. So I started talking to friends, family members. I was even at the gym asking the people <laughs> next to me, have you heard about this? Do you know this? And I realized a couple things. First, I realized a lot of parents had no idea what their kids were looking at. Um, everybody had the not my child viewpoint. And then I also realized they were scared to even talk about sex because I had thought, how am I going to get parents to talk to their kids about the dangers of online porn without, if they're not even willing to talk about sex? Mm -hmm. So that was the first books that we did were the 30 Days of Sex Talks series. And we put out a new second edition last year in late 2023. And so that's the the one that you mentioned was the new second edition and so that was the first books we did. And then a couple of years later, we, again, we kind of were like, okay, it's time to kick it up a notch. We want parents to really feel comfortable diving in. So we wrote How to Talk to Your Kids About Pornography. And we've written some other books, you know, like How 30 Days to a Stronger Child. We've written some children's books on healthy body image and using technology for good and understanding media because there's so much in the wallpaper of our lives that is talking and teaching our kids different things. And most of when it comes to sex and our bodies and love and intimacy, it's mostly false or unhealthy messages out there. And so we want to help parents really empower their kids with healthy knowledge about the positive, wonderful parts of intimacy, but the realities that are out there that are shaping our sex lives and our kids' sex lives. They are inundated today with all different kinds of messages. Oh, for real. I mean, I would ask your, you know, your audience to think about, you know, are your kid are you were you exposed to even 10% of what your kids are exposed to on a weekly, monthly basis? They are, you know, they are exposed to probably a thousand percent more hypersexualized media than we were. You had to really seek it out. You know, there was innuendo, but there was not the in your face stuff that is all around them, whether it's on the playground, if it's from billboards, if it's walking in the mall, if it's at the checkout counter while they're doing their homework and stumbling upon something innocently. It's just so much more than you or I was ever were ever exposed to. Yeah. And uh, how do you, you know, what do you think some of the messages that they're getting are from all the being inundated with so many different messages? Like, can you think of like mm -hmm. what like the top five are that you see? Uh, I would say the top five is there's a lot. So I would, one of the you things you can I, go over I was, five yeah, if you need I was to. Like, I was like, one of the big things is that um, relationships are optional, they're not important. That and if they are, you know, they're a joke or they're a punchline, you know, like in the, and even in the some of the most fun comedies that are out there, it, you know, oh, let's make dad look like an idiot. And mom is always trying to pull one over on dad. So right there, we have these unhealthy relationships or we have the idea that relationships are totally optional. Another message that our kids are being is that me first my needs first. So, and that is probably the biggest message, say in pornography, right? My needs, 
my sexual needs above anybody else's. It's all about my pleasure. Um, you're just, um, you know, a decorative object for me to act out on. And it's typically the woman, right, who's being acted out on. But there are other messages. That's another one. I feel like there's a lot of messages teaching our kids to pit themselves against each other, men versus women, not let's do this together. Whether that's working together, whether that's having a healthy relationship or let's have sex together, it's not about mutual respect and kindness. That is, mm. again, it's optional. And that to me is an extremely unhealthy unrealistic message, right? So we have these messages. We also, of course, have all the body image messages. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to be beautiful enough or hot enough. So you need to buy this product. You need to look this way. You need to have this hair, this makeup, and you have to fit into this tiny mold. Otherwise, you're not, you know, desirable. You're not attractive. And that leads to a whole bunch of other messages. Um, and problems. But I would say those are probably the hugest ones that are, they're so big, they have threaded their way into the fabric of our lives. These negative messages about our bodies, about genders, and about relationships, because they're harmful. They're, they're basically the things that are pulling our culture apart, you know, of just not having kindness and love for each other. It's, um, it's ridiculously you know, it's just damaging, just damaging to all of us individuals, as couples, as a culture. So it's, I mean, it's just so important that we be having these conversations with our kids to sort through all of those messages that they're receiving. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm curious. It's just, I don't even have this down to ask you, but I was at a wedding and it was interesting because a conversation um, came up around, um, uh, teenagers, college kids, 20, you know, kids in their 20s, not dating mm, and yes. not having the relationship. So I thought that was interesting that you said relationships are optional. And I also know that we live in a big hookup culture now. Definitely. Do you find that that's true, that they are not, that they're not dating as much? There's definitely not as much dating. And dating has definitely changed. So what I am seeing, and I saw that this has been happening for years. You know, my, when my daughter was first, we had a rule about no dating until 16 um, in our family. And what I noticed, so this was kind of like my first clue that led me to research, was seeing that the relationship was happening here on our phones, right? And I remember telling my daughter, you're not going to have a texting relationship with this boy. You are going to have conversations you need to be talking to each other on the phone. You know, and I was not saying like this was going to be some sort of huge, long lasting commitment, but I wanted my daughter to learn how to talk to the opposite sex, mm -hmm. to have a relationship, that that was part of the whole point of dating is practice, right? It's not, you know, we, we kind of forget to teach our kids a lot of things with dating, but particularly that this is about practice, that this is not, that the point of dating is not to get to sex. That can, mm. you know, in a committed relationship or whatever your values are on that, that's one of the parts of it, perhaps. But that's not the point of dating. Is it's not to get to sex. It is to learn how to behave. It's to have a good time. It's to learn what you like and what you don't like. And so we had some discussions about that. And I remember after a couple of weeks, I gave her this little book of questions. You know, where you ask things like, "Oh, what would you do with a million dollars?" or what's the best thing that, you know, has happened to you this school year or whatever. I mean, these were not deep questions, but it was to get them talking. After a couple of weeks, she came to me and she was like, mom, I'm so glad you said that to me. This is awesome. I am having so much fun. I am learning so much. Da, 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 da. And basically because of that, my daughter taught four different boys throughout high school, how to talk and how to behave on a date because I was like, you don't make the majority of this date of dating of, of being on, on your phone. And she would talk to me about that. And it was something I heard from, I've heard from tons of parents of where these kids will, they'll text each other or Snapchat, you know, they'll snap each other, just pictures, right? Not even conversation yeah. pictures for weeks, and then they'll have a date, right? And that at that point, they think they are in a full-blown relationship, 
And you and I might be like, what? What are you talking about? But that is how the culture has shifted and how their thoughts and brains have shifted, that a relationship, a full-blown relationship can happen 90% through the phone, right? So that is a huge shift and something that we as parents, I think, need to be aware of, not just for our kids in high school, but even our college mm -hmm. kids that are dating and helping them to realize and understand there's so much more. There's mm -hmm. so much more to this that can be and that they're missing out, right? So that's a huge factor is that we as parents, we need to prepare our kids to date and have some different conversations of etiquette and how to behave on a date. You'd be surprised at what they're missing, things that we think are natural, normal, and that every kid knows because we knew it just from conversations in high school, even if we didn't date that much. I did not date that much in high school, but I knew how to behave on a date because I went out with friends and groups and this and that. So I remember having a friend who they were so proud that they that their child wasn't dating very much. And to me, this was a red flag. I'm like, that's because your child is at home playing video games. Mm. Or you're and your, you know, your son is there and your daughter is scrolling through social media. How is that healthier than going on dates? That to me, I've always really encouraged that, right? I've encouraged group dating. I don't think single dating is good for high schoolers. I had to learn that mistake on my own, right? Um, something else we don't want to face that our kids are not mature enough. I mean, it is breaking up with somebody is really hard and really mm -hmm. painful. And our mm -hmm. kids are facing so much pain already that to me, it's we want to encourage them again to get that practice, to have that socialization. But we don't want to be like, yeah, get a boyfriend. They're just, they are so not ready. And it is that much more painful for yeah. them. Wow. Wow. So many things that you said were good um, that I have not heard people talk about when it comes to dating. Like, it's the end goal is not to lead up to sex. And I think that that's the scary thing when your kid starts dating in high school is, oh, I'm just glad they're not dating because if they were dating, then that is what's going to happen. They're going to yeah. end up having sex. So I'm just glad. Keep them at home yeah. on their devices versus <laughs> that this is an opportunity, like your daughter was expressing to you, an opportunity to get to know what do I like in someone? What don't I like? How do I have a meaningful conversation to really find out who this person is and what I, what I want in the future in a mate, you know, what, what, um, what does that look like? And, and that it, and that it is a skill set because yes. again, even dating is a skill set, just like we taught our kids how to tie their shoes. You know, we did these things, potty training, right? We were so on top of these things, oh, how to read and write. And then when it comes to relationships, these things that are actually the most long lasting, the most meaningful, the most important things, we don't train them. When this is, like you said, an opportunity you know, have try to be that house that the other kids want to come over and hang out at, right? Where they can, that is where they are talking and interacting, right? Where they are laughing together. They're not hopefully just, okay, they have friends over and they all just sit on their phone. Mm -hmm. We were kind of an unpopular, even though we had a nice house at the time when my daughter, they, um, we would not give the Wi-Fi password out to the kids. Right. And they would give us this look like, oh, your mom is that kind of mom. And I'd be like, that's right. I am that kind of mom. And I would say, I would like you guys to interact with each other and talk to each other. And they would. And then they would have an amazing time. Right. And have fun together. But teaching your kids, whether that's at the dinner table, how, how should we behave on a date? What do you want in a date? What do you want in a boyfriend, a girlfriend? What do you want in love, in a relationship, in a husband, in a wife, those are sex talks. You know, those are part of the sex talks. You know, people think, oh, it's a dating con Uh, uh That is part of this whole thing of you're preparing your child and your teenager to eventually have great relationships and a great sex life. And that's what I love about your books. You use the word intimacy. To have, this is about intimacy. This is about having a healthy relationship. This is about having great sex. Like, we, we 
<laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And Absolutely. I want my children when they are, you know, I have one married, two not, and, you know, one still in high school, right? I want them to have great sex lives someday, you know? So I'm preparing them young to love themselves, to have respect for themselves, to have respect for other people, to build those healthy relationships. That's, that's, I mean, I want that as much as I want them to have, say, good careers. I want them more to have great relationships and to have love and the, the best things of life, right? Yeah. Well, and I love how you were talking about having those uh, discussions at the dinner table about what, what a healthy relationship looks like. And you're like, that's a sex talk. And we don't think of that. That helps me because I'm like, okay, it doesn't, that is connected to having healthy relationships and eventually having, you know, having sex, right? Absolutely. Our kids are getting it all backwards. So let's jump in to how do we talk to them about sex? Like, where do we start? Great it's question. So so if you have younger kids, I think it's simpler. Now, a lot of parents, they they may feel like they've waited too long. That's okay. It To me, this is a never too early and a never too late to talk about, to share your values, your cultural background, your experience of dating and relationships. With younger kids, you're going to want to start real basic. You want to talk about, you know, liking yourself. You want to talk about my body. My body belongs to me. My, I might share my toys, but I'm not going to share my body. I want my kids to know how amazing their bodies are, not for how they look, but for what they can do and that they are so special and amazing. They're worth protecting, right? And that I'm going to do my best as a parent to help protect them. I want them to know they can trust me, that I love them more than anything else in the world, and I'm going to do everything I can to protect them. So that's a good building block right there. That is a sex talk loving and caring for your body and knowing that it's special and amazing, right? So with younger kids, just real basic information, you know, parents always freak out about, okay, when do we talk about penis and vagina, right? You want to talk about anatomy and get your kids comfortable. That's the getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, right? But we want our kids to know every part of their body. There's nothing wrong with your daughter knowing all the parts, right? I always ask women, like, how long, when was it that you actually found out that your vagina was different than your urethra? And everyone laughs because it's usually, <laughs> it was later than it should have been for most uh -huh. of us, right? Why was it not until 10, 11 or whenever that we knew that it should have been at age three and four that we understand there's different parts that I have an anus where my poop comes out, that I have urethra where my pee comes out, that I have a vagina, right? That there's are good, wonderful parts, just like my elbow. I know what my elbow is. I can know what my vagina is. So keeping it calm and matter of fact, because the most important thing about this is, so I'm not going to create an event in having this conversation. This is daily conversation. Find, think about, you know, when do you have, when does your child open up? Is it at the dinner table? Is it when you're laying them down for bed and you're reading a story and maybe you get in bed and lay with them and they chat with you? Use those times. Is it in the car driving? Hither and, you know, figure that out. And then you want to have those because we need our kids. This is the most important thing. We need them to be able to recreate that conversation when they have a question, when they've heard something, or heaven forbid, if something has happened to them, we need them to be able to tell us accurately, as accurately as a young child can, and share with us what their thoughts are, what they, maybe you explain to them what their body parts were, and they're always going to miss something. Even and when you get to the mechanics of sex and, you know, having that conversation, they're going to forget, they're going to miss something. And I think, parents freak out and think that's the first conversation. No, you lead up to it. Start with the easy conversation. Start where you're comfortable and where your child is comfortable. We occasionally hear from parents who, you know, their kids, they start talking about it and well, I cover their ears. They run out of the room. That's okay. You're going to get there. You don't have to, you don't have to push that conversation today. Do the other conversations of helping them understand you know, their body, helping them just understand respect and kindness, you know, having them, you know, what do you like in your friends? Because talking with younger kids about friendships, 
Those are the building blocks for talking about the difference between friend relationships and romantic relationships, Mm -hmm. because that, again, is something that is very skewed and confusing for young children. You know, I love my, you know, I've, I can't count how many parents have said to me at seven, eight, nine years old, that their kids, oh, well, I love my friend. Does that mean I'm lesbian? Not necessarily. You know, what is that difference between a romantic love and a friend love? That's mm-hmm. a great conversation. It's not friendly and it's a sex talk, right? Yes. You know, and then when we have those conversations, that also gets us ready to talk about the opposite right? Abuse. You know, what is abuse? You know, where, you know, how will, what, what's a, what's a, you know, people sometimes, you know, the, the classic phrase is good touch, bad touch, right? But we also, you know, you have to be careful with that because sometimes a child that maybe has had something happen, they associate the bad touch with themselves, that there must be something wrong with me or I'm mm-hmm. bad because I let them touch me and helping kids understand, uh uh-uh, helping them to know that adults are never allowed to touch you where you're not comfortable, right? That's another great conversation is forced affection. Helping your kids know, again, your body belongs to you. And if your creepy Uncle Stanley wants to hug you and you don't like that, you don't have to hug them. And even with me, I might want to give you a kiss goodnight. You may not feel like it, and that's okay, because I need my kid to say, be able to say no. I need them to have the understanding that it's okay to say no to an adult, because that was something I was for sure never taught, and I never would have thought, you know, and luckily I did say no a couple of times when somebody did try to touch me inappropriately. I don't know where that came from. I'm kind of that might have just been me as a child, but I need, I wanted my kids to have that power to know, yes. you know, you don't say no to mom when she asks you to clean up your room, but you can say no to this person who wants to touch you or hug you, even a pat on the shoulder. So that's a great conversation right there is just touch. What do you like? You know, there are kids who don't like to snuggle. Most kids do, but there's some kids that they yeah. don't, right? Yeah. So help finding out what's, what's, what kind of, what do you like? Do you like a kiss goodnight? Would you prefer a hug? Would you prefer a high five? You know, that is a great conversation to be had more than once because it, it evolves over time of what your kids like and don't like as far as affection. So to help them distinguish what they are okay with and what they should es- expect from other people. What is the respect that you deserve and that your body deserves? You know, that that is okay and that it's okay to change over time. And it's okay to be mad at mom and maybe you don't feel like giving me a hug tonight. That's okay because it's your body. So that's that's a great dinner conversation, bedtime conversation that can help you to have other discussions about, you know, what what can we do if an adult or an older child wants to touch us and we know that, you know, that it's it's a place that my bathing suit covers. So I know I don't want to be touched there or they should not be touching me there. What can we do? Who can we talk to? You know, and then another great conversation that leads from that is who are the people we trust? Mm. Now, this is one that a lot of parents, it, this, this is where like it might get people, I think it's more the parents that have hangups and get scared, right? But have the people you trust 100% with your kids That should be a very short list, you know, and uh, like we've, we've lived in different places and I basically, because we've, I've moved a lot with my kids. So I didn't have people I knew for 10, 15 years. These were sometimes people I only knew for two or three years, but I basically was very observant of my friends, the husband and the wife. And there was typically only one family in my community, maybe two that I trusted 100%. Like I don't, I'm not a believer in sleepovers, but if something happened, like we had to get out of town or there was an emergency, who were those, that small group of people? Mm -hmm. Like it may not be all of your siblings or your cousins, you know, and I am a religious person. I go to church. I did not trust my whole congregation. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I just didn't know them. And I am willing to know, I mean, and hopefully your audience knows, you know, 90% of sexual abuse happens from people we know not strangers, 90%. 90%. And that is scout leaders, coaches, people at church, 
people in our neighborhood, step siblings, brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, right? We need to be really mm -hmm. real mm -hmm. with that and understanding that that is where most of sexual abuse happens, not from strangers. It's the people we know. So that's why that list, now you guys, not mean you're not friendly and loving and kind to the people in your community and your neighbors, but that doesn't mean you're going to, I'm in a rush, I'm in an emergency, I'm just going to trust my neighbor for this half a day while I go sort this out or, you know, whatever. I need to have that small group of people that I know I can trust and trust with my children's lives and future self-worth, right? So. That's a, that's a good conversation for us. It's a good conversation with your partner. Who do we 100% trust? Like I said, it should be a small, small list and helping your kids know who those that small list is because they might think it's everybody. Oh, it's everybody. It's all my teachers at the preschool. It's this, it's that. We love those people. They're good people. But these are the, these are the people we'd 100% trust. And that's, again, that's a conversation that evolves if you move or if as you get to know people better, et cetera. But that's a great conversation right there. So there's lots of conversations. And I know, sorry, I just focused mostly on little kids right there. But my point is, is you you don't have to go straight to the penis and vagina talk you know, or talking about oral and anal sex and vaginal sex, you mm -hmm. know, that's that, that, that comes with the conversation and it needs to happen younger than you think, unfortunately, right? Because of all the things our kids are exposed to. But if you're uncomfortable or you sense your kids are uncomfortable, start with the fun, relaxed conversations, how important our bodies are, you know, how wonderful relationships are. What does a healthy relationship look like? What does an abusive relationship look like? respect what do you want in a relationship someday those are simple start in those simple places yeah that's great and then how are your books different as you get into you write one for 12 and up so i'm sure you tackle a lot more of the tough things and being tweens and teens i'm thinking how do you start let's say you haven't really been laying that foundation our listeners and i love that you said it's this does not have to be a one time event conversation it should not be and, it yeah. should not be yeah yes yes this is weaving in healthy relationships and all of those different questions you brought up what yeah. are some of the things that you're talking about in your book which is excellent by the way that uh, we need to be talking to our tweens and teens about? So great question. So in the 8 to 11 book, I'll just give you a little cap there so you can understand the context of the 12 plus. So in the 8 to 11, we have a few of the things from the 3 to 7, right? How important our bodies are, predators, how predators groom children. We even start the conversations of LGBTQ discussions, different types of family. And this is all done in a very open situation where I want my books to appeal and be helpful. That's the most important thing to parents of any background. So it's kind of, it leaves parents with the opportunity to put your values and your cultural background, your feelings on it. So the questions are more just like, well, what do you, what is, what does LGBTQ mean? You know, that's a conversation, you know, tweens and teens. What do you know? Who do you know that's gay or lesbian? Okay. Are any, what are the kids at school saying? Okay. You have a gay friend. That's awesome. Great. Tell me about that. You know, what do you know about what it means to be transgender? Oh, okay. What have you heard? It's always fascinating. You will learn so much from what your kids, that's also why it's so important to have these conversations because then your kids feel comfortable telling you what they are hearing and what they are learning at church, at school, from the neighbors. And it's always way more than you ever thought. That's the crazy part. So we start those conversations. 8 to 11 as well, we have a conversation about masturbation. So same thing in the 12 plus. We have discussions of the mechanics of sex. We talk about, you know, healthy relationships, abusive relationships, LGBTQ issues. And we talk about, then we move it up to Another, we move it up another notch where we talk about sexual harassment, you know, unwanted sexual attention. This is an important conversation mm -hmm. again because it's no longer just for our daughters. 
our sons are being sexually harassed. I would say not quite as much, but they are deaf. I've been surprised at, and it's not just from opposite gender. You know, my boys definitely had unwanted sexual attention, not just from other girls, but from other boys at school. Um, your mm -hmm. sons and daughters will too. And from unlikely places, meaning it's not just at school, it's not just peers. You'll be surprised at what neighbors and teachers are okay saying to mm -hmm. your kids. Mm -hmm. um, another hugely important conversation, of course, in the 12 plus range and even younger, if your kids are mature enough, is a discussion about consent and understanding what consent really means. That is, again, hugely important because it, it's not just about vaginal sex anymore, right? We have a lot of kids who are now having oral or anal sex thinking, oh, it's not real sex. And maybe they're more willing to have that kind of sex earlier on in the relationship because to them it's not as important or it's not as intimate. And we need to be talking to our kids about all the types of sex and what they mean, because that also will help you understand what it means for your child, because I guarantee it means something different for them because our kids are being groomed by the culture in a different way because oral and anal sex are being portrayed as maybe third base now, you know, second base mm -hmm. even. So we want to have that. So we are on the same page with our kids. That's also half why these conversations are so important is to just know and understand what your child believes and thinks and what they are being influenced by around them in the culture. Yeah, they're, it's very confusing because I remember one of my kids coming home and saying, talking about anal sex and hearing about it and how a girl was having anal sex because she wanted to stay a virgin, you know, and she was like all confused about it. So, you know, Sorry, we, I shouldn't we, laugh. I shouldn't laugh. Yeah, yeah but yeah, but, but that is, but that is what they're point. thinking and hearing. Yeah. yeah. So, and, it, and you have to realize it's not, it's not what you think, like meaning, okay, so a lot of people will say, you know, might assume me, us, you and I even talking about it, that it's, oh, they maybe are conservative and don't think anal sex is okay. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with it. I get upset with articles, like an article that came out in Teen Vogue a few years ago, talking about anal sex and talking about how this was a great alternative, la la la. What I read into that was, this was a please your man kind of article. And this was what we were, that they, this is what Teen Vogue thought was cool and hip to be sharing with our teenage girls. And I'm reading through this, there was nothing. So let's say you're a, a very liberal parent. There was nothing in there about pleasure for the, for the teenage girl. There was nothing in there about mutual respect, about love, about building a relationship, and certainly nothing about her, her pleasure and how much she might like it or not like it. And I found that shocking and it angered me that I was like, they're, they're selling this to teenage girls as a great alternative, but it has nothing to do with the health, self-esteem, self-worth of the teenage girl. It wow. was, and I was like, and they, they were calling them, they, they thought they were probably being so cool, hip and liberal. And I was like, no, as a liberal person, I was very offended by that article, not because only it's, you know, dangerous to have to to be encouraging teenagers and that's not again okay t for one thing it's silly to encourage because how many teenage boys do you think are really going to be knowing how to pleasure a, a girl or a woman for one thing and being gentle in something like anal sex where we know that anal fissures and there's all kinds of health risks basically with anal sex but again none of that talked about in this article. And I just, I was so frustrated with this. And again, then like, and you have, and then you would know that anybody poo-pooing this article would immediately be written off as conservative or religious. And I'm thinking, no, this is just bad information for teenagers. And so that is kind of what we're up against as parents, that we need to mm -hmm. think about it, that let's not break this down into liberal conservative or mm -hmm. religious, non-religious. There's so much bad information out there for parents and kids that that is where they need us. That is where our kids need us. And so where it's so important for us as parents to get over our discomfort mm 
or get comfortable with being uncomfortable and talking about these things. Because one, nobody loves our kids as much as we do Mm -hmm. and cares about them. No one knows them as well as we do. And that is why it is so important for us to have these conversations, whether they're four or five or 15 or 16, that it's so important for us to give our kids perspective in what all this information really means. Yeah. Wow. I I did not know that article and just missing that all those important conversations in that article that they did not address. And I'm thinking as you were talking about the different questions to ask our kids, how do you how do you broach? I think one of the things that's scary as a parent <clears throat> about talking about uh, whatever your beliefs are about talking about uh, like lesbian and gay and all those things is how do we not put our own, uh, how do we keep it to our values? And how do we also have those open conversations where we're not coming off judgmental or we're trying to push our own agenda? It, that's, I think, really it's important. Confusing. And I, how, I do, think... how do we do that? Because some of the questions you ask, I'm like, oh, that might yeah. be scary to ask. And it, then it, what do I say? So the, the most important thing for that, for especially like an LGBTQ discussion is one, is to not assume that you know if your child is gay or straight. So I want to approach this in the most loving way possible. So that to me is the biggest, most important rule that as I approach this, because if I'm approaching it without the assumption if I'm thinking, yeah, there's a possibility my child would be is gay. So I am not going to approach this in a negative way. I am not going to put down being gay or straight, pansexual, transgender. I'm not going to approach it that way. So that's where I want to just start out real basic and just, you know, hey, I was reading something today, you know, or hey, I just got this book and it made me think about this. And I just wanted to know, you know, what do you know about being gay and lesbian? What does that mean? Okay. What do you think about that? Okay. Great. You know, do you have any friends that have talked about it or expressed an interest? You know, and you get, you gather that information. That first helps you to know your child's thoughts. Because remember, we want to meet them where they're at. So if they know nothing, okay, well, we want to share what we know. You know, and like all of us have a friend or neighbor. Oh, well, do you know so-and-so? Okay, well, yeah, she's a lesbian and she's, you know, a friend of ours. And, you know, she has her partner, you know, you know, okay, what does that mean? Yeah, they love each other. They have a different kind of relationship. You know, what do you know about being straight? Okay, oh, you know, your dad and I, you know, yep, we, you know, we're married. That was, you know, our preference, blah, blah, blah. And so helping your kids, so meet them where they're at. But also just never assume that you know what's going on inside. That right there will guide you in that conversation to make sure that you're doing it in the kindest, most loving, non-judgmental way. And also helping your kids know, beginning, end of the conversation, whenever, that whatever they choose to be, that you're going to love them no matter what. That's also huge. I remember, and I've reiterated this to my kids many times, I go, it doesn't matter what you do, if you choose to live your life the way I do or not, there's nothing that can stop me from loving you. You could maybe even commit a crime. You could do this or that. I just don't know how to not love you mm. no matter no matter what. And my kids have known my values and know where I've come from and how I've been raised because we've talked about these things over the years. And just reminding them, it doesn't matter to me what, mm. you know, whether you're gay, straight, lesbian, trans. I love you. I can't stop. I don't even know how. Am I always going to say the right thing? Nope. And that's where I need your help to let me know. If I say something that's mean or rude, you know, or offensive, please let me know, you know, and I will, we'll see what we can do, you know, because that's also another whole thing, right? Because our kids are, their language and how they're being like, what they're learning from the culture is different. Kind of like how, you know, there's certain things that my dad would say, I would never in a million years say, right? To me, it's like, it was so sexist. He was raised in a different 
time and different culture. We are we were raised in a different time and culture than our children, right? So we want to be we want to we want to be open to that. Doesn't mean we're always going to one hundred percent agree, right? But I'm I'm open to hearing your suggestions. I'm open to hearing what you have to say, and just always, like I said, reminding them, I love you no matter what. However you choose, if you're struggling with something, I want to know about it. Not because it's like fascinating, but I want to be on your team, and I want to I want to help you as much as I can as your mom or dad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love you no matter what. So pornography. And I know we're getting towards time, but I have to ask you about the whole pornography. How do you begin to have the conversation about, because they're inundated, they're going to see it nowadays. That's a sad thing. How do you have the conversation around porn versus healthy sex? What would you say to our listeners? Right there, you you just started it perfectly is how I would, you know, you can bring it up. I know this is everywhere. You've seen it or maybe you're, or you're going to see it. You know, even asking them, you can even ask, you know, when was the first time you saw it? Because most people, most kids have seen it. When was the first time? Oh, I saw it at my friend's house. Oh, I saw this, this YouTube video came up, blah, 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 real casual, real calm. And saying, this is everywhere. And saying, you know, this was not everywhere when I was a kid. And so I know, like, you know, I didn't see this until I was 25 or 36 or whatever. You know, when was the first time you saw it? And then they will pretty much, they'll be, they're typically pretty frank and it's like, oh yeah, I saw it, you know, I've seen it five times or cousin so-and-so showed it to me at the Christmas party or, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. They're going to, they have seen it now. If they, if they have never seen it, you can say, okay, that's, that's, I'm glad you haven't seen it, but, but you're going to, mm-hmm. you're going to. And for, even for a younger child, let's say, you know, being real basic, you know, do you know what that word means? What does that word mean? It, you know, it, it's naked and explaining it real simply. It's naked people. Sometimes they're having, they're doing a sexual act. Sometimes they're just naked. Sometimes it's a picture, but it's typically a video. That's something important to point out because again, remember for us as kids, it was a picture. We hardly ever saw videos of it. You had to really seek it out. Right. Mm -hmm. But now it's everywhere and letting them. And so starting that conversation of and of course, then sharing your thoughts and feelings. And if you have a rule about it, I don't, you know, this is something I don't think is appropriate. And this is why. And helping them understand the difference between that light and dark. You know, if we want our kids to even understand healthy sexuality, they have to understand that there is something dark out there, pornography that has false messages. You want to explain why you're okay with it or why you're not okay with it. You know, for me, I'm not okay with it. And I've explained to my kids, to me, it's very hateful towards women. Women are always, not always, but typically put in a position of powerlessness. There's name calling, there's spitting, there's hitting. This is not what real sex looks like or should look like. That sex, healthy sex is about mutual respect and love. And if you believe that's part of a committed relationship, share that with your kids. Why? Right. And then it's always important to share the why. Okay. Not Mm -hmm. that's bad. Don't look at that because I said so, or because it's gross, because it's nasty. You don't want to do that because then that's where, okay, I've seen it. It's nasty. That's where those feelings of shame and the secrecy starts. Right. So that's another great discussion that we have in our book is a discussion about shame and guilt. Right. And how a lot of people, they turn sex into something dirty or nasty and that you want to explain that sex is good and wonderful and positive and why you believe it's wonderful and amazing, that it's not you that think sex is dirty and bad. And so we shouldn't talk about it, but that it is something special and wonderful. And so that's why we want want to keep it that way. And that pornography is the opposite of that and helping them understand that when they do see it, that it's, it's fake right? That it's made for the purpose of making money. That's to me, it means to understand this is not a liberating, amazing experience. These are women and men that are being exploited, that are being paid very little to expose their bodies and something that could and should be an intimate act. Instead, they are doing this for the sole purpose of making money. 
-hmm. right? That this is not something about art and love. That's something else important. I think it's super important to explain that difference between, that's why intimacy is such a focus of our book, because pornography has no intimacy. There's no handhold. Well, there's a little bit now, okay? The porn that they are now gearing towards women, right? They have porn for women now, you know, um, feminist porn. They add about 30 seconds to a minute of hugging and kissing, okay? This is this is this is the bone they're throwing to women. Like, oh, see, it's porn for women because there's two seconds of kissing and hugging, and then they get right down to the act, right? Because that's what most porn is. It's just the act. And uh, what's silly to me because I remember being at a sex ed conference and this woman being like, oh, like, oh, porn is great. You you just need to watch feminist porn, and uh, you know when. And like, no, the feminist porn ends typically the same way. It typically ends with body punishing sex for the woman, meaning he's just pounding into her. And I'm like, yeah, this is so liberating. This is so amazing. It's uh, so feminist. I'm like, this is garbage. It's like, to me, that's like the hypocrisy of it all. The joke of it all is that there's nothing liberating, special or amazing. This is devoid of intimacy. Like I said before, it's all about my pleasure make sure I get off. And if my partner gets off too, good for them, you know, like, and that is where I worry, you know, we have every future lawyer, doctor, policeman, a lot of times getting their sex ed, right? Most of our kids are getting their sex ed from pornography. And that's typically because parents are not talking, are not opening their mouths, sharing their wisdom, with kids of what sex, the potential and the greatness of sex, what it can be, what it, you know, what it was meant for, like that. So we have this huge disconnect of parents not talking and kids being raised on this counterfeit version of sex. You know, this McDonald's, to me, it's McDonald's cheeseburger sex, right? When you yeah, think of all the food, way to put it, McDonald's you, cheeseburger yeah, sex. Like when you think of all the food in the world, all the delicious, amazing food out there. And then you have you have these companies online telling you this is what sex is. Here's a Big Mac, and you're like, that that is that's the big liberating sex picture you've given me. I'm like, no, <laughs> sex is so much more than that, right? So hopefully we can help our kids understand that. And that's why we need you and need to order your books. And I did order your book for the younger kids for my grandkids today. Oh, so awesome! I'm so Thank excited you. Excited to like start in, give it to my daughter to share with them too, because we need to be having these conversations. And I do have a video series that is coming out in the next couple weeks for parents who are super busy and are not able to, you know, sit down and read the book, even though the books are broken down into little lessons. Now I have a video series coming out where parents can watch or listen to it, get the ideas. They'll get a digital copy of the book as part of it and makes it even, even simpler. So. Love it. Okay. I'm excited about that. So Dina, tell them where to find you. We're at educateempowerkids.org. And of course, we're on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all that good stuff, but the website and where you can find the video series and the books, um, educateempowerkids.org. The books are also on Amazon, the 30 Days of Sex Talks and all of our other books, but the website is the main the main hub because there's also tons of other free resources on there. And our email list, you get two free ebooks from joining our email list. So there's always, I'm, I'm a big believer in free and inexpensive stuff. So yeah. And, and all the, and you have the, you have the um, digital version. You can get the book, but you can also get it in digital mm-hmm. version. Absolutely. Wonderful resources and blog posts and yeah. And those free books. So yeah. So check that out. Educate and empower EducateEmpowerKids.org. EducateEmpowerKids.org. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Today. Thanks for having yeah. me. Well, that's it for today, friend. And thank you so much for joining me. And I'm so excited to announce our new platform that has so many 
awesome resources. You can find free downloads and printables, such as best movies to watch with your tweens and teens, fun ideas, conversation starters, affirmations, gratitude exercises, and so much more. And all of these resources are to help you build up your relationship with your tweens and teens and provide you with the support that you need. And we also offer eBooks and workshops and additional resources to support you. So make sure to check it out at Moms of Tweens and Teens Resources dot com. So have a fantastic week and I look forward to seeing you back here next week. <music>